All right. Well, welcome back to Experienced Focus Leaders. It is my special pleasure to introduce you to Mike Fulgner, uh, my personal friend, uh, an investor in Relate2, but more importantly, Mike is to video startups and video technology is what you know Pink Floyd is to psychedelic rock, right? This is this is the godfather of innovation and video. He's exited his startups to Yahoo back when Yahoo was cool and to, to Twitter back when it was Twitter and not X, then ran um, inside those organizations, ran their video programs. So Mike, welcome to the pod. We're excited um, to have you on board and also hear about your latest uh, project, Scenery Video that you can see here in the background, which um, is going to redefine the, the exactly right which is going to redefine the way great videos are created. Welcome. Well, I when you I didn't know where you're going with the Pink Floyd psychedelic, psychedelic but then you uh you finished it with uh with music, which I think is uh you know, we're in I'm in the valley, so you never know where you're going to go with this podcast, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> but we could say you're like what? You're uh you're like uh uh classic rock like yeah classic rock and uh Led Zeppelin, <laughs> you know we could we could we could work with the metaphors but but fundamentally you you've um you've really um you know stuck to uh reimagining video in in various formats um in the ver in various kind of distribution channels so guide us a little bit about you know the evolution of video in you know in the time that you know you you know you've started from from your first startup onto today, um, that's a that's actually kind of a fun thing to talk about because it, it it's hard to imagine today a time when you couldn't just take a video you know not just from your phone but you know when we when I started working in this video was shot on on film primarily and and actually uh, when we were in business school together is when I started my first company Jump Cut. And um, one thing I've always uh, I've tried to do, I've, I found it to be helpful to try to try to identify um, moments in the market that that where there there are opportunities where you can start to play in areas where potentially incumbents or, or other people can't play. And um, this was back in 2003 when, when you know, 2003, 2004, when we first kind of started thinking about the idea of jump cut at, at Stanford with you. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we were in business school together for the, for the audience. Um, and uh, the, the don't hold it against us. I was, <laughs> I was the uh, I didn't I didn't see the startup ways right away. But uh, but Mike was always an entrepreneur. So he's uh, um, he's a doer, not not a <laughs> not not a not a big big business school You're too talker. Kind. So, You're too kind. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I actually I like being in big companies too. But um, the um, the uh, at the time, video was shot on film. And basically our, our thesis was we saw o, o photo and Shutterfly take off. And when, when you convert um, a film process to digital, uh, then you get all of a sudden you can share a file. You have a file on your computer. You can actually do something with it, put it on the web, put it on a website, let somebody else see it. Um, and so we kind of had this idea that, you know, O photo for video was going to happen. And, uh, you know, Chad and Steve had that same idea at YouTube. Um, and there are a couple other people we, we pitched that idea as a group at Stanford and Eric Schmidt was the professor and I, my, my buddy was sitting next to him and he said, this should get funded. He wrote on, on his, his, his little note and uh, he never became an investor, which is probably a big mistake. But um, we, I, 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 the mistake I made was I waited and finished school and then found my co-founder and, and, um, and uh, started Jump Cut. But uh, if you know, we, we could have been off to the races. You never know how it would have went, but it, it, it went it went really well. We we started jump cut in you know two thousand five, and and so that was that's your first project, yeah. And then you you kind of and tell us like basically jump cut kind of started allow you to basically start editing those those videos you know in the yeah it was really video sharing was kind of the core thing you couldn't do before just take a file from that yeah. from a Sony cam camera from a from a mobile phone later in the in our in our lifetime. Um, and uh, and give it to somebody uh, that they can view without having to download the file and put it into yeah. you know, real media player or whatever um, Windows Media Player, uh, and then um, and then we we got a little aggressive. And we built a the we built a fully in browser Flash based video editor, and Flash was actually a brilliant way to uh, build technology back in the day. You could actually 
do really uh, interesting compositing. Um, it was really good with graphics. And so uh, we built a, a, a basically an iMovie competitor um, for consumers where you could, you know, we, our use cases were wedding videos and anything. We, we did a deal with Fox Atomic where you could take and remix a movie trailer for them. And mm -hmm. we, got, we got a lot of traction with like an early community uh, of uh, creators. And, um, and uh, we actually had a, a lot of interesting social features. We had a feed of activity and you could, you could heart, you could like videos, which I think uh, we were one of the first companies to do that. But it was, uh, it, we, we had a lot of traction. Uh, it was also a very uh, competitive environment with YouTube really kind of taking the oxygen from the room. We had niched out a little creator uh, area, but YouTube was really hot on uh, really copyrighted content. They, they struck gold with letting people share Saturday Night Live videos and music videos and, and also other real videos. But they, they really, uh, uh, you know, they, they kind of got a little traction from that. They did a really good job um, embedding in MySpace pages. And then we were, we were very friendly with them um, and we were we were a very good technology fit, and basically uh, the the path for us became clear that if, if in a copyright unfriendly world, um, it was probably better for us to join forces with uh, with somebody that was bigger. So we 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 actually talked to kind of uh, Yahoo, Google, YouTube, and Yahoo at the time was actually a strong a strong company to to go with, mm -hmm. and and I, I, I it was a fantastic experience there. And um, we ended up selling it to Yahoo. And what was it like? So you're an entrepreneur and then you're joining Yahoo. You know, you're, you know, we, well, how has this, you know, accelerated your ability to innovate? Um, obviously reduce some some legal concerns, right? Like, yeah. but it, or, or has it, um, has it been difficult? Like, you know, most people kind of envision that they are, they don't envision the exit, right? Like, and you kind of, you were really successful operating and, you know, more than one, you know, um, larger, larger companies after exit, what did you learn? Kind of what did you have to adjust as an entrepreneur, you know, post exit to be successful? So I think my, my first learning, I was pretty, I was pretty young and, and, um, at the time. And I actually was, uh, uh, a couple of months in like six months in, I was actually given a very large responsibility at Yahoo with, which was the entire video, uh, team. I was a GM of video and I ran, all the players across the sports, you know, news, uh, music, and um, and and all of our back end plus the video search. So I had a I had a large uh, kind of um, uh, large team across a lot of different areas, and um, it was the one thing I learned is that as soon as you as soon as you sell your company, you, you really have to get on board with you know being a being a part of this other organization, and those are those objectives become your objectives. I think. When you when you can have a lot of tension is when you kind of hold on to some of the ideas that you maybe had prior to acquisition and then um obviously you want to come in with your passion and and your ideas but um you are actually now working for this other company um they brought you in for a reason but um that that was a learning that i kind of had to i had to learn like you know it, i was really passionate about jump cut but really the the bigger opportunity for Yahoo at the time was licensed video. We were by far the largest streaming platform of, uh, of video content. We were, we were basically the only company making money streaming video. And, uh, and our pro my problem became entirely different was competing against YouTube. YouTube is sitting there, you know, for instance, we have Yahoo Music over here, which was the largest music streaming service by far in the world. Mm. And uh, we did deals with all the music labels and we monetized videos. So as a consumer, you would playlist video, but you'd have to watch ads and you could go over to YouTube and get all the videos that were never outside of windows with no ads because YouTube wasn't, nobody was uh, uh, taking them down yet. And so that was, those were the type of problems I now had is how, do, how does Yahoo's uh, a business that's being rights friendly. We were, you know, big part of LA scene. We were complying with all the, uh, um, all the, all the uh, existing uh, agreements. How do you compete with this new entrant that isn't doing that and therefore has a better user experience, but the, but the clients that you're working with aren't yet suing them. They haven't really made the decision of what they're going to do. And so those became my problems. And so I'd say the learning there is, is 
you know, very quickly kind of like take the magic that you have that they, mm-hmm. that they bought you for, but also like really adopt, like what, what are the, what are the new objectives of the company and, and try to be successful within the organization that you're actually a part of now. And, and the more you can do that, I think the, the happier you are. And Mike, one of the things I admire about you is that you, you know, after your kind of stint at Yahoo, right, successful as it is, you decided to go back to video. And it sounds like the more I listened to what you were doing at Yahoo, the more I realized you actually took some of those same ideas and applied the lessons learned in your next video startup where you you had like clients like NFL and NBA. Uh, so very, very high value licensed content. You know, tell us about that process where like first, like, why you know some people want to try different things you decided to stick to it um what kind of what was it in you that kind of kept you sticking to it and i admire that because i actually think the people that um really understand the problem very deeply you know and stick to to space tend to um tend to grow with this and like have have you know a set of insights but like was it just you internally passionate about it or you just saw another opportunity because you were so close to the market guide us on your next move so the the um the one of the teams that i uh i managed uh, was was actually in charge of editing all of the content for all of the yahoo channels and this is way back in 2008 or 2007 when um when you know the major league baseball and nfl all these content rights holders they don't have digital teams yet they're just doing linear television and in fact like all the linear television windows don't allow you to post video if you're complying by the rights agreements and you're playing ball with all the rights holders, you actually can't even post a video to the internet for 48 hours after the, the show airs. So the, the, the industry was structured against a fat, like anybody posting content quickly to the web, like Yahoo's business was all like longer tail, like, yeah. like well after the, well after the game summaries. Um, and we, we had built out the largest content team in the world making all these highlights. We were actually cutting the highlights for all these rights holders, and we would actually give them the highlights that we cut as part of our deal because we, we had this digital content team that was uh, doing this. And so um, as, as Facebook and uh, as an executive at Yahoo, one of the things you saw is that Facebook was just, you know, the, everybody was sharing the charts of like how fast Facebook was growing and what a threat they were going to be. It actually wasn't common knowledge across everybody, but, um, you know, Ash Patel really was worried about Facebook. And mm-hmm. I remember talking about the charts with him. And um, and so I really started studying Facebook. Uh, we had some classmates that had gone there. that So we knew about them. And then Twitter, you know, was obvious on the scenes. And what was happening was Social media was an entirely different thing than YouTube or, or uh, and social media was actually fil- feeding the fire of YouTube virality. And what was happening is people were just pirating uh, like NFL content, uh, touchdown w- uh, would be scored and that would post to uh, Facebook and Twitter, a YouTube video would be linked there and that would go crazy in the first hour, right? And that, that was not what Yahoo could do. Yahoo couldn't even, did, and, and the rights holders didn't even have any business inside that window. And so, that was the, in what I said before, like sometimes as a startup, you see these opportunities where you're like, there's actually structural reasons that, that, that incumbents can't play here. Mm. And, um, and so, so this is an interesting opportunity. And so when I, when I left Yahoo, my co-founder and I actually, we, we tried to not go to video. We actually sat for six months and we said, we're going to have an idea a week and then we're going to evaluate the idea technically and business wise. We're going to have like, uh, we brainstorm ideas and then we kind of like evaluate one a week. We did eight ideas and the first one was live video post-production that was our first project and we did seven other ideas and we kept coming back to like how how good is this compared to what we have and there was obviously we had really good founder market fit in that first one we had other ideas but um we just kept coming back to it and so we so we started uh snappy tv which was all about how do we how do we make it as fast as possible for a rights holder to take a highlight from, you know, a slam dunk on TV, uh, a quote from a, a State of the Union, and put it into Facebook and Twitter, where all that viral was happening. And basically, the value prop to them was, hey, your your content's getting pirated, and all these views are not accruing to you, and you get make no money. If you just if you just put your content there, then um, then uh, you'll get all those views. You can actually take it down faster. So it was a really clear value proposition to the rights holders. The biggest mm. thing was is that they actually contractually could not do those, but 
what was happening is all the TV rights agreements were being re reworked. And as they were being reworked, they would write in, okay, eight digital highlights within the window of 24 hours. So they were basically writing in, and it was actually a really fun position because we kind of became experts at what rights you actually wanted. So, uh, you know, sometimes I would be on the phone with general counsel for a major broadcast network or a major uh, studio. And I would actually be kind of giving them advice on like, here's what I see from like the type of rights you want to have to maximize your, your live audience. And, and so we, we became a very friendly uh, company to rights holders. Mm -hmm. And, and it was a, it was a fantastic position. We were just really at the, at the right time as these agreements were getting redone and um and uh it, and and snappy was basically the kind of the leader with uh that live post production into facebook twitter and youtube you know as rights as the content was happening got it so you know you you basically are taking what you've learned you spotted a particular opportunity you've expanded a set of relationships that you may have already had, but probably didn't, you know, didn't have fully at Yahoo. Um, what were the challenges in in doing the second one, right? Like, as people, uh, you know, people always say, like, first time entrepreneurs pursue one type of thing, second time entrepreneurs pursue something else. Um, you know, what did you find that surprised you? Well, so so I I the, even the way I hear myself tell the story, there were there are parts of it that I skipped. So, so one part I skipped was we actually were wondering whether the right way to go about this business was to play ball with rights holders and like be their be their partner or say there's all this piracy happening just like like co-op the piracy and and our first prototype was actually an iPhone app where you could watch TV and it would sync with the TV and you could when you saw the highlight you wanted you hit a button and you got an instant replay on your phone that you mm. could share. Mm. And it's actually, it's a better app. It's a better experience. It's really it, the, the, I, that we were kind of a one-to-one. -one. Um, and, and so, but, but we were trying to do that with a deal with the rights holders. And so we'd go yeah. and we'd say, Hey, we're like, like put license your content into this experience and you'll own all the, all these like consumers sharing it. But the problem is, is they didn't have the rights to do that. Like no one had the rights to do that. And so it was actually uh, the, the, we had these two approaches, like, you know, just be a tool for post-production and then do the consumer one. We tried it. And um, the challenge was, is, is, is we, we just, they, they couldn't grant us the rights. Like no one could grant us the rights. So the NFL didn't have the rights. Fox didn't have the rights because they had, the agreements didn't allow for it. And so we had to kind of navigate that. And then what we, what we were getting was like, we would demo and we give them the app and they would actually use it for their social teams. And they're like, this is, we can get content ourselves in seconds as opposed to four hours or 12 hour turnaround time from our video production team like can you just give us this and that was kind of our initial idea and, we, and so we said okay there's a poll there let's let's actually like not try to do the consumer thing and then we pull and then we pull over here and that was actually uh one of the challenges was we had already talked to these people as like hey here's an idea to maximize your rights we were rights friendly but we were we were this consumer thing and we had to like reset the entire conversation of like we're no longer the the company that's trying to do these weird rights things we're just like straight and narrow video production down you know no rights issues and so um and we're going to help you ma maximize your rights so we had to reset that in the market um that was challenging um and and uh i i think there's there's not really a lesson it's effectively a pivot like you kind of pivot and you just need to be aware of the cost of the, you need the to be cost aware of, of the cost like like the cost to us was actually the, the the engineering cost of pivoting we we actually kind of built the infrastructure to do both we didn't really know which would work yeah, yeah. i i under anticipated the cost of having to reintroduce myself to these people uh as as a as a friendly like as a like a down the down, straight down the middle rights person that you can yeah. deal with as opposed to this person that's like has this interesting idea you're I'm, i was i was always playing ball though like i was never I was never trying to do something that I wasn't going to talk to the rights holders about. And so that, that was not as, as hard, but, um, that was, that was a bit of a pivot. Um, and, and, uh, I think it was, it was an interesting, uh, it, it also added two years probably to the, to the lifetime between, you know, initial idea and product market fit and growth, like uh, probably a year and a half. Like we, we had to, if, if we would have just done the first idea and just ran straight there, you know, it, it, I, I think uh, 
the company would have been successful, more successful earlier, which is always good. But um, it turned out it turned out well. We learned a lot. And um, I, I think the, the lesson there for me is like, you know, you can get in the market. You need to learn. You need to be fast. You need to cut. You need to cut things that aren't working, even when your team kind of like is, is it was challenging to, to, to say, well, let's chase a different idea. Um, uh, that, that was actually a, a, a challenge, but, um, you, you, you have to do it. You have to move when, when you feel it. And, and you as the CEO, you're, you're in all the meetings, you're, you're getting the feedback. You, you kind of, the chair you're in is important and it's hard to communicate everything you're hearing in the, in the, the sixth sense you kind of develop because of what you're hearing internally and externally. And you really have to trust, uh, some of those intuitions that you develop because sometimes you can't even explain everything you're hearing but it just be kind of comes comes to you second sense because of all the meanings you're in got it so you you kind of had to take the tough decision and was was selling to twitter a tough decision like obviously it's a company that's in the news and everybody wants to hear what's your take on that and twitter then and x today but like was how was that how did that feel um gonna when you when you had to make that call it was a much different decision than the first company. The first company was, uh, we were in the middle, we were a very small company that was, we only had raised a million dollars and had built out a product. We had to raise again in a rights unfriendly landscape it, with like a kind of an unproven thing where YouTube was taking off. So that company, I feel like selling was the right, Jump Cut was like, that was the right thing to do is to is to kind of exit that, that, um, and, 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 and yeah. we were, and, and, and history has probably proven this, right? I, I think maybe there were like five of, I think over 300 video companies that actually returned investor money. And so um, it was really a bloodbath uh, with, with, with that market. Um, with Snappy, uh, it, it's interesting because you wouldn't think about it, but in 2012 and 2013, when we started to make money, uh, enterprise SaaS was actually not that favored. We, I was actually having a hard time raising money um, and we were growing revenue pretty, you know, we had crossed a million, you know, we had, we had eyes on two and a half million. We grew to 5 million the following year. We were going to do 10 the, the year we sold. Those are really good growth numbers now. I mean, I, I mean, the valuation two years ago, I would, I would have raised a, a monster round on, on those growth numbers. But at the time, uh, uh, VCs didn't, the VCs I was talking to didn't really like uh, uh, enterprise SaaS. And they also were really concerned with my market size. Um, and um, I was, I, I actually, as a, I kind of had an intuition that it wasn't um, as small as people were. They basically were like, you have the NFL and the NBA, <clears throat> who else are you going to get? And we hadn't cracked the international market yet. Like, like it turned out Oracle was a huge customer for all their conferences. They wanted mm. live highlights of their conferences. So the market was big um, and gosh, like live video is, hasn't gotten smaller. <laughs> and so, yeah. um, uh, so I, I did, it was, it was, uh, it was interesting. Um, I was having a hard time raising uh, that next kind of growth round. And then Twitter, we were, we were monetizing um, like live highlights and we were a, a large part of their video revenue when they were, you know, right after they'd gone public. So that, that, um, that made a lot of sense for them. And it was also, the comps, the public comps at the time were like Brightcove, which was trading at one one x uh, revenue. Like, so it wasn't really like the 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 the, the end point. The raising wasn't clear. The end point wasn't clear. And then and then we had like a a, a large value to a strategic partner immediately. So that made sense at the time to me, even though Twitter didn't want to own a SaaS company. Um, and NFL didn't want their video infrastructure belonging to Twitter, but we basically gave Twitter a two year head start on live highlights, which that turned into a hundred, you know, hundred plus million dollar business inside Twitter. So we were a phenomenal. Actually, Jack Dorsey said, you know, told me that Snappy was probably tw one of Twitter's best acquisitions. Um, and, uh, and this, by uh, the way, for those that don't know, Twitter did quite a few acquisitions. So this is actually, <laughs> <laughs> this is non trivial statement. I, I and I don't it's actually like you 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 got you kind of want to have him pause on that maybe I didn't do as good a job negotiating because like you kind of wanted to hurt a little bit more but we uh um but the uh but it was a great fit because we we really drove a ton of content and a ton of revenue in Twitter and and that was actually I had a great time at Twitter we plugged right in had had an awesome uh fit with all the teams it, immediately we had global distribution to all content everywhere because Twitter had content teams on all continents. 
So we were, we overnight, we, we got all the European sports leagues using snappy. We got, you know, news, you know, um, news, uh, organizations in India and the middle East. Like it, it was, it was crazy how fast we grew a thousand percent growth, you know, and, and, uh, and, and then they would turn on monetization too. So it was a phenomenal acquisition for Twitter. Um, and the team was, uh, my team was great at Twitter. Um, I think we made a big impact on that company. And so all that was great. That said, you know, a year later, SaaS, SaaS startups got hot and our revenue growth would have been, probably would have been, it wouldn't have been that big, but it would have been continuing. And I think we probably, uh, probably would have done really well as an independent um, because the, the, there's a lot of companies that kind of filled our space after we exited while Mocha and WSC and, and, um, and they all turned into really nice businesses. And I know those founders are great. And so, um, so I think it, it's, it's, that's one where I'm like, I probably, probably would have been like a, a better idea to, to, to hold on to that and see where it went. But I also had a great time at Twitter. You, you, can't, you didn't you do can't too really shabby. You were like, I remember meeting your GM of basically their, the video business um, at Twitter. Right. So like, how was that as a culture at the time? And, you know, now that, you know, Twitter continues to be in the news, um, you know, what, what's your take on what's going on there? And like, you know, okay to, to share controversial views, obviously, I, but like what, what, you know, guide us a little bit and then and now from what you see. Well, I wasn't a GM. I was, uh, I did, I, I ended up branding uh, the a chunk of the video business, the live business, and then the Periscope team, um, which was, is also a phenomenal team. I worked for Kayvon, um, mm -hmm. but, uh, um, but uh, Kayvon was a GM, but um, the, uh, so the culture at Twitter was very flat and, um, and, and the talent at Twitter was insane. And so um, the, the, uh, it, the, and then the other thing that was, I was actually, I've been very fortunate to be a part of two organizations in the Valley that have had just world-class sales teams. So Yahoo, mm -hmm. when we joined, uh, their sales team could sell ice to Eskimos. They were just, they were just so good. And then Adam Bain, who ran, who ran the sales team when we joined there, the the salespeople that he could get would would um, Twitter. It was figuring out the model, but they could sell anything, and they were they had relationships. They and there was value in what we were selling. Um, it just was hard to. It wasn't as the, at the scale that Facebook uh, and others were, um, but it was. Uh, it was a great uh, organization to to be a part of uh, because there was actually excellence across different things as, as, as much as uh, Twitter gets kind of hammered for that. Like there were really great people. Now they, we had major infrastructure issues in, and we didn't ship nearly as fast as we should have at the time. Um, and, and people were working on that and there was a little bit of decision paralysis, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had, I'd also learned to just like, um, I didn't want to be a person complaining. I want to be a person helping. Like I, I just, I, I wanted to kind of like, get in the boat and, and just like, you know, pull people in and, and, um, and I, I really tried to just reframe things and, and try to be, try to focus on the things that could change. And, and one of the things that did change was, uh, uh, the, uh, the focus on uh, data driven and, and, uh, decisions in, in machine learning, um, while we were there, like in the last couple of years, I was there in 2018, 19. Um, and that really turned Twitter around. We started really seeing, uh, user growth. Um, and, uh, and I think it was, it was well on its way to turn around. It, and then I think, uh, I was, go I had been well gone by the time, you know, Elon, uh, the, it tried to buy it. So I don't really have, uh, any direct stories there, but I think, uh, you know, I think, I think Twitter had already, um, had already turned around and had already been, um, you know, on, on the path to, to, to growth and, and doing well. Um, I do think he, one thing I will say is I do think he underappreciated kind of the, the, the ad business that they had and the relationships they had and how that team really could punch above their weight in the market. And, and, um, uh, I, I think he might've been done, but he might, he might've actually caused himself a lot less pain if he would have, uh, kind of eased up on that business and, and kind of rode that a little bit and then transition slowly, but he, he's not that type of guy. And so, uh, I, but it, it, by, by our reports, the people that are still there, like they, it's kind of fascinating working for him. It's, I think it's challenging, but he does get stuff done and I love my Tesla. So 
Um, I, I can I can have to, I can have multiple opinions about him, <laughs> uh, but but I think generally he's probably the best entrepreneur of our generation. So um, it, you know it's fascinating to watch him from from afar. And and how would you like now that you're in the third startup and by, which by the way scenery is sort of like I I you know simplistically describe it as the the figma of you know video collaboration. I think you have a slightly more nuanced description. Um, last time we spoke, but you know, I'll, we'll, we'll dive into that. But you're now in your third. You're backed by some of the best investors in the business. You know, the 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 Greylocks, the Crafts, Figma itself. Uh, you know, back to you. Uh, you know, tell us about your style and kind of what are you? How are you adapting? Uh, you know, obviously you're again tackling video, but like, how are you adapting your leadership style? Um, because, uh, you know, for many people, it's kind of painful to work for first time entrepreneurs who are like still figuring stuff out. And uh, by, you know, by having worn hats, having let larger teams, um, I, I imagine you can kind of refine your approach. And, you know, I'm curious what, you know, what you're feeling yourself and maybe what you're hearing from from the folks that you work with. That's a good question, Alex. Um, so let me t let me tell the the, the group about scenery. Um, so. We, uh, we, we became at, at Twitter, uh, the, I saw the transition from like, from our design team. I was always, I, I, I wish I could have been a designer in another life. I, I, I really enjoy working with designers and, and, uh, having that creative process. Um, and, and Figma was a huge unlock for me The the, the Periscope team, I think was the first team in Twitter that adopted Figma and it was a game changer for me because as a product leader, I went from seeing this awesome work that a designers would do where they would show us stuff in presentations or, or PDFs and then um, and then and then we give them feedback and then they go away for two weeks and we come back with a revision. Um, and, and then all of a sudden they said no and just go to this board and you can you can cruise it yourself, you can grab something duplicated. I'm just like this is amazing like I, and I and I would actually use that to like deconstruct how these wonderfully talented designers actually made this because I'm like, I can't make that. How do I make that? And then you can actually mm -hmm. just see how they make it. You can you can kind of deconstruct it. I thought it was in, uh, one of the biggest, I, I think Figma is is one of the best products that's come out of uh, tech in the last, you know, 20 years. Um, uh, and so the, and we, uh, when Ryan and I, w after we, we left Twitter, we, we were going to do something together. Ryan Cunningham is my, my, uh, my co-founder for all all three startups, um, we were, we we're talking about what, what we could do. And we, and we just kept going back to designing things in Figma. And we're like, man, this, this is how video editing should be. Like there should be, you, you shouldn't have to lock people out of projects and unlock them and everything should be real time. And you should be able to share, share ideas and more easily pull things apart. And it's kind of how, how, how can video editing be more of a team sport? How can organizations, especially during COVID when, when everybody was outside the edit bay, like mm. we just talked to, we started to interview customers and there was this huge need to be able to say, like, I used to be able to sit in the edit bay and review things and change things on the fly. And I can't do that anymore. Um, and so we, this, this really like brought this idea to, uh, uh, uh on the forefront and we, uh, and so we got really excited about it and we, um, and we started the company, we, st we, we pivoted at COVID to go after, you know, Figma for video editing. And, and that's how we founded Scenery. Great. And and so describe to us. So it sounds like part of the recipe of success is bringing the band back together and working with people who you know how to work with. You know, tell us a little bit about the fundraising process. Some folks are curious. Some folks are, you know, wondering what does it take uh, to to get attention of you know great great VC firms. Um, tell us about your journey there. We've been able to attract um, just a world class team of people that know uh different areas of the technology and um and that has been um i think that's different because i think we uh with this company we've we've been able to really get um people that have had a lot of seasons experience in different areas um that has been great and then um the uh the it, and then but it's also we, we're growing this company in a covid situation we we were remote and we've been remote we're actually going to get back start to get back together with the Bay Area team in person. So that's been its own unique challenge. And I'd say that that nothing in my startup uh, experience has 
uh, really uh, prepared me for the, the, like how to work remotely continually with an entire team. And um, that that's had its own unique set of challenge that I think uh, I, I don't get I, I don't get a lot of credit for past the uh, past history of what of what you had done because it's been you know async work and you know heavy documentation and uh, you know talking over Zoom and having to figure out how do you how do you keep everybody on the same page when you make these really you know uh, uh, big leaps in in assumptions as a small team over Zoom how do you actually bring everybody else along. When they're not in the same building, it's it's just an entirely different dynamic, and so hmm. that's been a, um, a, a learning for me. And how how and and I've had to go back and and kind of become a little more of an IC because I think documenting everything and uh, and sharing kind of learnings as you go it becomes even as a CEO it becomes critical. And so that's been an interesting uh, difference between the previous companies and this one. Interesting. So even though in the meta world you're kind of creating video for remote teams but you still deal like as a product builder yourself you have some unique challenges um was how do you build a product which some of the decisions are a little bit different than yeah and they're probably they're decision. probably you have to undo some learned behaviors that that yeah. made you successful before and you have to rethink it so i can imagine some you know some some first-time founders actually being better at that <laughs> so so uh um it's not necessarily the uh the advantage but i you know you got to be learning um but the, actually the the fact that scenery, I mean, the, the, we are, we, we are eating our own dog food. You know, we're, we're, we're a remote team and we have a, we have a product built for remote teams. And so, um, and, you know, scenery's value proposition is really taking, uh, the content creation process from soup to nuts and putting it into a single platform. So, uh, if you're a team and you have an asset library, you need to pull, you know, brand assets from here, you, you're, 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 you're pulling webcam video, you're, you're, you're somebody else is recording something that you're going to edit. Um, that all lives in the same place instead of disparate hard drives on people's, you know, inside people's homes. Um, you can easily pull things in, you can cut them live together, just like Figma, you see cursors moving and then, um, and then you can instantly review anything. So if you and I are doing this podcast edit, I do a couple cuts, I can, I can share the link and you don't have to wait for me to render something and put it into a different you can just look at what i'm doing you can say hey you spelled my name wrong boom it's fixed everything is real time and then you and then you publish it and then you have your entire archive not just of the video that's created but all the work and and that's a game changer because you can go back and pull segments like i liked what i did in this one i can go grab that title sequence drop it in another project so it becomes the the uh, you know cloud serv- cloud team based software you know and the notions the figmas it accrues over time the value accrues over time the more the more work you do in it the more value is actually in that that doesn't exist in video because video just stays on people's hard drives it's actually worse over time because if you have two different video editors they store things differently their whole work pattern is different and so we we have all these customers that that when they actually like say well, we want to go into the cloud. It's actually a huge pain in the pain in the rear because your everything is everything is done differently. Whereas like whereas in scenery, because it's cloud based and all the projects are together, everything is coherent and people can dip in and out. If somebody's sick, just pass the project on to somebody else. That that that's the new way of working. And frankly, it's not new to most software. It's just new to video. It's you just can't do it with a video editor right now. So. It's this this idea is kind of more straightforward in a lot of ways because it's just this is this is the inevitability of software that is cloud and team based and video editing for professionals is not there yet. And so it's kind of just the, the it's just an execution game. Can we can we can we get everything performant? Can we deal with large files? Right. All those things. And, Which was and, a big issue for Figma, for example, right? Like because it, it wasn't obvious that the technology could be performant and because that was sort of the the, the hard technical problem to solve and it sounds like you're also doing that but right. some of the upper the the user behavior is the risk by the way if you're watching this uh this is going to be edited courtesy of scenery so we're really excited uh to to be walking the talk this is, you know, this is my way of acquiring a customer i'm i'm, I'm, yeah. pulling, I'm pulling him in here <laughs> <laughs> you've heard of that you've you've backed up our vision and which, by the way, actually, we, you know, we were really inspired by what you were working on was videos and kind of creating short form video formats in, in your past. And 
uh, what we uh, found is we started transforming relate to, we were actually, you see here, content experience pop up. We actually started at first with documents. And we said like, what's the lowest common denominator of a medium that has not changed besides a video? Well, actually documents, PDFs and PowerPoints have effectively been around since, you know, before the World Wide Web. And so they're pretty old school as well. And so we wanted to transform it. And one of the things that we found, thanks to our customers, is that the easiest way to transform it uh, is to actually enrich it with videos, right? And it could be a video in the background that you designed with the help of scenery that kind of reflects your, your brand B-roll, or it could be like just a snippet of a live video what you could drop from you know, YouTube or Vimeo or Wistia or just an MPEG-4 file. If it's something that's secure, it's not meant to be for public distribution that you could kind of present it to us. And so, we really quickly realized like when we say, well, we transform documents, it just wasn't like doing it justice. And so we kind of had to do our own mini pivot and we became not a document, you know, experience platform, but we became a content experience platform. And, you know, the most successful users, uh, you know, bring in video. So we're really excited, you know, to support what you're doing, but effectively democratizing amazing video creation, right? And the better the video, um, the more you could start mixing it with other formats um, that, you know, that allows like for different learning styles, right? Different preferences of how people consume information. So, you know, we really support your vision, you know, I, but what's your general take? Like you, obviously there's a lot of changes in content, you know, you've, you have the pattern matching, um, you know, you see that video is catching up to some other products, but what's your general take on the future of content? How do you imagine it? you know, in video, but also expanding because we, we see ourselves as a multi, uh, you know, multi-model solution, right? And whether it's, you know, especially with AI, right? Like so historically people, oh, well, it's text to, um, you know, text to audio or text uh, text to video. And um, we kind of, we, we like the idea that you could actually combine different mediums together, right? I think that's where, what, where the consumer experience really asks for, because you just never know if somebody wants to watch two hour video or they want to find the, the exact snippet and then read some text and drill into something more substantive from there. So that's our hypothesis about the future, you know, of video that it's going to be deeply integrated into other mediums. What's yours? Um, I think that the, I think that that's, that's right. And it, it, you have to look categorically. You have to look, you know, it, it's, you know, what's happening for consumer video on mobile devices versus what's happening with, you know, uh, um, content marketing versus, you know, documentary and editorial uh, video. Those they're, they're actually they're actually really different answers. Um, some right. some commonalities. That's right. I'm, I'm too narrow in the in a kind of co like B2B, B2B focused content and you're too cool. But but the audiences are yeah yeah <laughs> the audiences are on the mobile devices and so i think actually one of the things that we we find is that uh the uh we don't have to sell the idea that uh even when you're doing a, a webinar or a podcast that you actually have to think about how do you how do you reach your audience in these short form fast twitch you know scrollable mobile environments what 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 format of this conversation actually hits with that audience that that's actually a component um that everybody has to think about and and that we don't really have to sell that but that that that's actually uh the market told us that and so um i do i do think there's commonality and there's also you can't just think about the video you're making for this one you know youtube channels you're distributing you you have to think about where are all the places my audience is that i'm going to you know appeal to them and then what is the format that this content can take? Um, you know, that is so so that's that's one thing that we're investing heavily in is is and scenery is really, really good at that, where you can take uh you can take this webinar, you can actually identify what are the great moments that might work on social, push those out in the right format. Can you make me good looking? Uh, you know, add a little bit more more hair here, a little I think. Uh... I think yeah, AI I, is uh, is is on the way. I mean, I I mean, talk about you know giving me hair that that this uh, AI is on the way for that, but um, it's not good enough yet. Otherwise, uh, otherwise I'd have a different look right now. But the, uh, the I, and actually I think AI is going to affect everything. Um, it's going we we're we are investing in it. 
Um, I, I'm sure you are as well. I think uh, uh, I do think that the generative AI stuff is going to be incredibly uh, interesting and important, but also I don't think it's going to be necessarily dominant because I think at the end of the day, you know, people do want to see, you know, you and I having a conversation and, and that that content is is actually um, I mean, I'm a big podcast consumer and um, I think authenticity with with people will always have a place. Yeah. And so um, so we're 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 you investing don't want me AI. talking in this voice about <laughs> this podcast. Cast. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll it, all that stuff will work. There's a place for everything, especially advertising. But but um, you know, we're we're we actually you know uh, our one one of our beliefs is that this there's just going to be a ton more video out there to edit, and and you are going to uh, AI is going to help you get to uh, places. But there's all there's all there's all there's always going to be ways for humans to make decisions yeah. on what the content should be, and 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 uh, we want to make sure that that that's kind of the primary driver of the, the editorial process. So we're really building for editors. Um, yeah. and it's creators. hard to acquire good taste, right? Like, I think that's sort of yeah. what we were finding. It's like, it's, it's great for ideation, but one of the things and back to kind of the value of AI, you know, one of the things that we realized is that, you know, there's so much experimentation. You kind of need to go and find like, where are people finding value first? And then figure out if the AI or sometimes algorithmic approaches could support those pockets where there's real value. And mm -hmm. so in our little world, like I was saying that we love, you know, we'd love you to succeed because we could have more great videos to put in. Um, we found that when people come out, like typical presentation is static, right? And the moment you try to load, let's say some videos into PowerPoint that kind of blows up and it just like becomes non-shareable. You obviously can't put videos into customer facing PDFs because that's not even a thing that 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 PDF can support. And so um, but but people love the idea of kind of emotional movement on their cover page when they introduce their idea and their chapters around like the conclusion, uh, you know, something surrounding important demo. The demo itself could be video, but surrounding it. So what, what we found is people love this or what we call a background video, which kind of fills in underneath the text, right? Sounds kind of obvious, right? A little bit of creativity in AI, yeah. kind of a sense of like picking the right, the, you know, the, 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 like the right dimension so it fits right in. But we literally started saying, hey, let, let's go build out a library of perfectly tuned videos. And then the 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 kind of the smarter brains than mine could uh, go and figure out what will match what, you know, people could put in their branded content. And so, for us, this has just been like really transformative little thing, right? People found value in it before AI, right? Like they, they, this was, this was there, it's proven. And so then you can use the tech, um, whichever tech you're using, right? Like to then fill in those gaps and right. that create a little magic out of a, what used to be static slide, or you know, you would try to be forced historically, try to put some gifts in there, which kind of would be slow and, you know, or if, or if you believe GIFs, you know, that depends on your, you know, <laughs> where you are in that religion, how you call it. So that sort of is our kind of conclusion is that you you sort of need to work back as to like, what would make the end user experience, you know, less about, you know, less about, oh, great, some generated stuff for me and more about like, I want to interact with this. I want to feel something from this. I want to, this is an experience. So we call it interactive AI or hmm. kind of an interactive led AI and I think it can use generative to your point, right? Like, but it's not generative is just a step on the way to delivering some sort of emotional connection, some sort of value to the end user. Is that kind of in line with what you see, you know, in the in the space and particularly with a video focus? You're deeper in that world than we are, obviously, since we cover broad sets of content. You know, it's it's funny. I think I think that that's a good approach, and I think uh, I, I've seen I've seen other companies be successful. I've seen us be successful with with uh, with those. You know, how how do you how do you take something that the that the that the creator wants to achieve and just give them a little bit of help to 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 get there faster? Um, that's that's a great use of it. I also think that some of these, you know, some some of these generative things are going to actually be fantastic, and and you are going to be able to say like I want this, and you're going to get something that is what you want. And so um, I think uh, I think it's going to happen everywhere. Um, I think I think that what what 
our approach is really uh, uh, focusing on the workflow uh, and focusing on the the teams that have you know uh, that it, we're we're actually we still are big believers in collaboration. Um, teams that have teams that are remote, they they need to they need to work together. They need to understand what people are doing. They need to go through and get feedback on their work. Um, you know, uh, just all, all, all that stuff, I, I, I think, uh, is always going to be a necessary part of, uh, of a team based content uh, creation experience. And so, you know, we're focused on these, these, uh, you know, content marketing teams, uh, you know, and, and uh, agencies that are that are working with clients, any anybody where you're, you have somebody that's doing the work and somebody that's giving feedback on the work, you know, we, we, we add a ton of value to that. And then we're we're looking at ways to have AI help in the process, but I think people that are doing full AI bets, they're you know, Synthesia is the the, mm -hmm. the AI company that no one talks about. Now people are talking about it, but man, they're killing it. Um, and so, so I, I'm a believer that it's just gonna it's gonna be kind of a bunch of different flavors. Um, you know, we're, we're making our investment kind of because who we are and what we're focused on, and. But I actually think a lot of it's going to work, and this isn't this isn't AR VR this or 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 uh, you know NFTs. This is this is this is, is real deal. Mm -hmm. This is fundamental, real, going to going to be in everything. Already is, um, and uh, and I think we're we're that's kind of how we're how we're treating it. But uh, you know, I think our core is still is still workflow and collaboration, and and um, and that's also something that. Um, is uh you know ai doesn't really solve for exactly, having teams, yeah. having teams be together in in their own workspace as opposed to disparate applications and disparate hard drives so so we're, we're just finding ways to actually have uh, be helpful to to our original vision that's great and very authentic of you because i think a lot of people want to start jumping on the bandwagon whatever that is right like you kind of listed a few trends that were very popular and so you know, you could see some LinkedIn experts who were like NFT experts now are AI experts and, you know, et cetera. And like people shift. And I think if you're like focused on what you're passionate about, focused on what your uh, mission is as a company, um, focused on your customer, then you could start bringing in those technologies if they are relevant. And it sounds like that's your approach where you're kind of not saying it's not going to happen, but you're just staying core to your mission. And, uh, you know, I, I respect that a lot because it's sort of it's th the easiest thing to do is kind of follow the buzzwords to some degrees. And I think that's but not again, this is more than a buzzword. Happens. This is different. <laughs> this well, is the, it is the right. One. But like you're not saying you're not following it. Right. You're just saying yeah, it will yeah, yeah. Be a, it will we're be sprinkling like, it. In. You, you got to do your first job. Right. Like what's your yeah. core? And I think very correctly. So like, if you know, this thing goes in ways. Right. And you have to have a collab like. In documents, for example, there was first like, hey, I can, I'm, I'm in PowerPoint. I create some bullets, right? Like, great. I'm a, I'm a democratized basic creation. Then there's a wave of, um, uh, you know, I, I can use Google Slides and Google Docs or Figma in your, in your universe of so like, great. That was collaborative now. So that sort of was the second phase. Now there's maybe the third phase, right? We think it's more about interactivity and end user experience. Some people think it's about AI. So it's most likely it's a combination of the two, right? But like you have to, you can't skip phases. You can't just skip the collaboration phase unless you want to produce something that's, you know, you know, not, you know, very consumery uh, where there you're the only creator, right? Like it's fundamental and fundamentally you're addressing a more sophisticated market Absolutely. that does require collaboration. So hats off to you. I admire anybody who dedicates you know, a large portion of their career to refining one discipline. I think that's where a lot of breakthroughs happen. So I'm, you know, excited for scenery. Thanks for inspiring and, and supporting us. And um, Mike, if anybody wants to find you, sign up to scenery, what, where can they, what, where can they do this? Go to scenery.video and, and uh, it's a, it's a freemium model. So you can give it a try and, um, and you can um, uh, feel free to ping me on LinkedIn or reach out if you, uh, if you have uh, anything specific you'd like to talk to, if if there's something about what we do that is interesting to you, I'd love to. I'm always interested to hear uh, feedback from uh, the product, the market. Um, and uh, Alex, thanks for having me, and congrats on all the success with Relay Two. It's uh, it's been fun to watch your journey, and um, and uh, thanks for doing this. Amazing. Well, everybody, Mike Faulkner on Experience Focus Leaders. 
to use another music metaphor that we kicked off with the Bob Marley of reggae. You know, the, this is the man, the same man for video uh, collaboration, creation, innovation. Thank you, Mike, for joining us. And we hope um, we hope this was fun for for our audience. And, you know, one of the themes that we want to bring in is not just to speak to folks that are in the larger enterprises, but we also want to speak to the innovators on the ground who are experimenting, trying new things and changing the future of content, you know, that people that are helping create the most engaging content experiences quickly. You know, we love to partner with them, learn from them. Thank you, Mike, for being part of our journey. Thanks.